Okay, welcome everybody. So, my name is Gambor Sabo, and uh, honestly, it's hard to position myself uh, what I'm doing, but my daughter already told to everybody, my dad is an engineer, he teaches machines and sometimes gives presentations. So, I guess this is the most accurate uh, <laughs> what I am doing here. Okay, what we will uh, see tomorrow? Uh, not as much uh, uh, home assistant, not as much uh, uh, smart devices, however, uh, I will show you some, but a completely different topic than uh, Mickey presented. Today I would like to uh, show you uh, uh, the Azure Arc uh, story, how does it work, how it uh, um, can be integrated, how it can be used, and I also brought to you two use cases what I will uh, introduce to you, and you can also uh, touch it, see it uh, in the break as well. So, what is Azure Arc? Azure Arc is uh, Microsoft or Azure's uh, hybrid cloud uh, solution, an ecosystem or a framework, how to connect uh, the on-premise servers to uh, the Azure uh, ecosystem. Very similar exists on the Google side, like the Google Antos or the Amazon side with the Amazon Outpost. So, this is not a, uh, a unique thing. In Azure Arc, we can uh, connect our on-premise servers to the Azure ecosystem and we can manage uh, centrally. Typically, these are made uh, done by agents, deploying the agents on top of the uh, servers and uh, um, checking if all the updates are applied, uh, if there are any vulnerabilities, etc., or managing the databases centrally. But there is one unique thing in Azure Arc uh, which does not exist in the other uh, solutions, and actually this is the Arc-enabled services. Arc-enabled services makes the, the things a little bit different. The Microsoft guys, three years or four years ago, decided that, hey guys, we are containerizing our services and uh, we are using it in Azure uh, for um, giving away to the uh, people, to the users. But if you already containerize it, it is already running on top of Kubernetes, then it is agnostic to the infrastructure. So why not give these services to the customers as well, to the users? And here came the idea uh, to deploy the Azure services on the customers' servers as well. And here came into the picture the Arc Enabled Services, which is the topic of uh, uh, the today's presentation. What does it uh, uh, mean? For the Arc Enabled Services, we need a Kubernetes cluster. Typically in an enterprise environment, this is a multi-node cluster. We have multiple servers. Uh, we deploy uh, Kubernetes with high capability. But in my case, I have just one notebook and the one SBC, small uh, board computer. Uh, as a servers, so it can also work with a single uh, node as well. But the point is to have a Kubernetes cluster. Once we have this Kubernetes cluster, we can connect it to Azure. But what does it exactly mean? It means that uh, instead of deploying any kind of services in the Azure uh, data centers, we can select uh, our own server to deploy the services. And these services are a wide range of services, like databases, Postgres, SQL, or uh, uh, application-related services like uh, uh, app services, uh, V functions, logic apps, uh, or API um, management. And the most important, which is also part of our demo, is the Azure Machine Learning. So, as you can see, there are a lot of Azure services what we can deploy on the server. To be precise, it means that if uh, we have a workload, what we cannot bring into the cloud, then we can bring the cloud to our workloads. There are still workloads which cannot uh, just uh, easily uh, move to the cloud because the data is still too sensitive just to upload it to the cloud, but we need to process it locally. Or the use case is so time sensitive that it is uh, 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 not affordable to send it up to the cloud and wait for, I don't know, just 100 milliseconds even just talking about milliseconds to get the answer, but we have to process it locally. So that there are still workloads which uh, requires hybrid cloud solutions and deploy these services locally. But Microsoft says that, okay, if you cannot bring the workload, then I can give you the platform services. So you don't need to re reinvent the wheel, but you can use the app service environment to make your code, deploy your application. You can use it for uh, uh, the same way as you can uh, do it for the public, public applications. So if you have some workloads which must be closed uh, into an on-premise system, then you can use the same framework uh, what you use for those uh, workloads which are uh, publicly available as well. So 
Here we get a platform solution on top of Kubernetes, which uh, is uh, given by Microsoft. And uh, uh, this is the cool stuff here. And this is what I also used in these uh, uh, demos as well. But let me show you uh, how does it work, because it is much easier to understand it. So for example, if I would like to deploy an app service, then I just go to the portal. Let me zoom in. And similarly, like if I deploy a simple app service, I just create a, uh, click on the create button. I select the Alice Do It Yourself workshop. Let's give a name, a web page. This will be a container. And here comes the magic that you need to select the re region where you would like to de deploy. This is typically East, US, West Europe, uh, wherever you deploy. So here you can select the Azure data centers. But once you attach your server or your cluster to the Azure environment, then you can also select it as uh, a destination. So instead of just uh, uh, deploying into Azure data centers, you can select your own server, own cluster, and uh, say that, yeah, deploy this application on my server. Yeah, I will just do it, select it. So I need to go back. I also have the same settings, what I have in the public environment, so I can <coughs> select the database, I can uh, set up the containers, I can select where to deploy. So everything is exactly the same except that the destination will be not an Azure, a Microsoft managed server, but it will be my server. So I will still own uh, the compute capacity, I will uh, still own the networking and the data as well. So everything still remains on my side. I just use the platform, the ecosystem. And then just a simple review and create. And if I click on the create button in 30 seconds, the container would be started on that notebook. But Please excuse me, I'm not doing this right now because I would mess up the demo <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't like to risk that. But believe me, in 30 seconds the container would be created there. Okay, but how can we use this uh, uh, at home? Honestly, it is heavily on over engineering. If you have a do it yourself project, then you are going with uh, um, more, much more reasonable solutions like Mickey presented with the Shelly or the Home Assistant or some ESP controllers, not over engineering uh, at such high level. But there are also do it yourself projects for education purposes, and that was my purpose. Uh, three years ago when I started this to uh, learn about the edge cloud solutions, the hybrid cloud, and how I can deploy Azure services on top of my uh, own servers. So at my first uh, um, use case, this is a plant monitoring system. The story is very simple. We have several uh, uh, plants, Siklaman, Ghana, Kulayalut, Magyarul, and uh, Kalanchu. Uh, what I borrowed to my, from my wife, and uh, I wanted to monitor uh, their uh, soil moisture when they need a watering and uh, when uh, we need to take uh, more care about them. This soil moisture uh, data is collected by a simple ESP controller, so not a big thing, not a big budget. Then we have a notebook as a, a, a local server, and the Kubernetes is installed on top of it. And this notebook is running a Mosquito, an MQTT broker. So all the data arrives to the server in MQTT format. And this is done manually, locally, so uh, no Azure yet uh, in the picture. Okay, for the GitHub, I will come back for a second. In an Azure environment, we connect uh, this server to uh, the Azure ecosystem, and once it is connected, then we can deploy several services. We would like to store our uh, data, our measurements uh, in a database. So first of all, we need an Azure PostgreSQL uh, CPR uh, database, and this is also deployed uh, from the Azure environment, and I can show this to you. So if I just go to the PostgreSQL, then you can see a soil DB is deployed. And this soil DB is running on top of that server. So from the Azure portal, we can easily, with few clicks, we can deploy additional services, new services. But then we also would like to uh, write the data into the database, because the Azure Postgre cannot consume MQTT messages. So we need a small script which translates between uh, MQTT and SQL. And for that, I used uh, 
I just wrote a simple Python code what I uploaded to GitHub, and from GitHub I uh, built uh, a Docker container what I uploaded into an Azure Container Registry, so it was already in a accessible uh, container registry, and from that uh, I deployed this as an app service, a web application. Web application, again I deployed it via the Azure portal. So once I connected to the server, then I can fully manage it from the Azure portal, and from the app services you can see that there is already a DB Writer named uh, app service, what I deployed from the Azure portal directly to the server. Okay, super, our data is already in the database. What's next? We also would like to show it uh, to uh, everybody, and for that we need a Grafana. For a Grafana, we can uh, deploy it again, very simple from the, the, as an app service. And the good news here is that uh, the Grafana needs a backend uh, database to store the uh, dashboards, the connectivity, the users and whatever. So we can use the same Azure Postgres SQL as a backend for the uh, Grafana to store in the Grafana related stuff. And we can use the Azure Postgres as a source for the time series <coughs> database as well. And the greatest one is that we can configure it via environmental variables. So once I deployed the uh, Grafana web application, I can simply set the environmental variables where to find the Postgres. Just a second. Environmental variables. And if I sh click on the show values, then it shall show it, but it doesn't show it. <coughs> okay, anyway, it, uh, here is the GF database post, and that will be the uh, Postgre server. Sorry, demo effect. Let's try again. And as the uh, Postgre and the uh, Grafana both are running inside the same Kubernetes cluster, we can use the Kubernetes naming conventions. So here, as the uh, database host, we can mention uh, the uh, SoilDB external svc.soildatabase. The soil database is the Kubernetes namespace, and the SoilDB external svc is the um, name of the service inside Kubernetes. So we can use the Kubernetes internal service names as well because everything is running inside the same ecosystem. And we can set up this environmental variable simple on the portal so we don't need to uh, touch the Kubernetes anymore or the server, but uh, we can manage uh, directly from here. Super, we have a Grafana so we can watch it and you can also watch it, so it is really working. <laughs> but what's next? Uh, if we have data, then we can also uh, consume the data, we can utilize the data, and this step is not implemented yet, but that's the plan uh, as the next step. So we can use some regression models in machine learning to determine that which is the best uh, watering level for the plants. Because for example, for the cactus, cactus don't like the water, so it won't drink the water, so the uh, soil moisture level won't drop uh, as fast. But for example, the cyclamens, cyclamen loves the water, so uh, it needs a higher uh, watering level. And uh, with a simple regression model running uh, on the same cluster, we can determine that what is the best watering value for a, for, for, uh, for a plant or a flower. So we can feed this back, this information, to the microcontroller, which can uh, also control the watering as well. Over-engineered? Yes, like hell. <laughs> But uh, this is a uh, lot of fun to uh, deploy uh, cloud services directly on a notebook which doesn't have a, a huge CPU or memory capacity, but uh, it is just a standard notebook. And yeah, again, this is a cheap variant, because, um, I mean, a cheap setup because I just borrowed the notebook from my wife and the microcontroller cost, I don't know, three euros or something like that. Sorry, we may have missed something, but so how did you train the model? So which data did you get? Uh, this part is not implemented, but I will show you. Uh, but I will show you another uh, use case where I train the model. Okay, what's next? I have very similar problem like Mickey. Uh, where is Mickey? Uh, which is called wife. So my wife also says that I have too much uh, stuff at home. 
and uh, uh, I shouldn't buy any more thing. But the good news is that you can also sell new uh, new ideas to her if you combine something. So my uh, wife wanted to get uh, a, a roof on top of our terrace, and I told to her that okay, let's have a roof, and then let's have a water collector. Now we have the water collector, and now I can start to wiring out the watering system, which will be of course automated. Uh, in the last autumn, I also uh, upgraded our bird hotel as well, which got uh, a solar panel and uh, 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 a small battery and a charger, so that will be the source of the um, power. And I can use the microcontrollers by connected via Wi-Fi uh, to uh, control the watering as well. And as you can see, I also use a home assistant, so I use a combined solution here as well. So that's the next plan, next uh, step. Okay, IOTrains, a little bit different uh, uh, demo, a little bit different use case, uh, how can we use the Azure technology. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, there are uh, more than 10 different uh, services uh, Microsoft already adopted, and one is the machine learning. In the machine learning, uh, uh, what we can do, that we can train a model in uh, the central uh, cloud, and then we can push down this model to uh, our endpoint, our edge cloud uh, uh, server as well. And this was my use case to, to demonstrate that how this can work. So uh, there is a, a toy train going around, and uh, there is a model which recognizes the level figures, and this model is running directly on this edge server, and uh, it can recognize the level figures almost real time. How does it look like? The first variant, it, this was this one, and it is demand. I had to balance between uh, uh, when I uh, set the camera to the uh, toy train, then I had to balance with the uh, power bank because it was too uh, front heavy. I had to figure out how, that, how to play with the cabling, and uh, uh, in the first variant, I used the uh, um, first generation Raspberry Pi and uh, the, uh, it didn't have a, a Wi-Fi module and I started with a small stick but it was too slow so I had to grow in a 15 centimeter antenna because I had just uh, that one at home so yeah as you can see it's pretty ugly and this happened in November two years ago and how lucky am I that uh, the Christmas just came and my son got uh, a toy train <laughs> <laughs> a Lego toy train, which is much more robust and uh, it can also hold uh, uh, much more components. Yeah, high five. <laughs> so this was the second variant. Let's see uh, what are the components. Of course, we have a, a toy train, which is almost damn fast. <laughs> uh, we need a camera. And yeah, this is a marketing slide, so don't be surprised if you find uh, some uh, very special uh, descriptions. I still have a, a Raspberry Pi which uh, uh, collects the pictures and uh, uh, transfer it uh, to the server uh, via the Wi-Fi antenna. Of course, we have a, a Hoover bank which uh, uh, has everything. And here is our uh, uh, prime actor, uh, Ted, uh, who will be uh, fined by the AI model. The whole thing is just uh, for collecting pictures, so nothing else, no extra processing, no uh, any special thing, and that's why I also used a, a first generation Raspberry Pi because I just had a spare one at home and it just creates pictures and uploads it, nothing special. And how nothing special it is, uh, here you can also see that uh, uh, I created a second variant from the first one uh, with an ESP32 uh, cam controller. So it is just an ESP microcontroller with a camera. It just creates pictures, nothing else, and it just uploads. And then with this, it is much more solid, much more reasonable size, and uh, this is much more uh, matching to uh, the size of that toy train as well. Okay, how does it look like? Very similar as previously, we have a Kubernetes cluster on the server, and uh, actually this notebook has an NVIDIA GPU, so it has an a, a accelerator uh, in it, so we can use it for uh, running the AI models as well. The camera collects the pictures and sends it uh, to the server, and here it's jobs in done. It's done. Then we again connect the uh, cluster to uh, the Azure environment, 
In the other environment, I train the model just to recognizing uh, uh, Lego figures. You ask that uh, how I train the model, and uh, uh, you need to create a lot of pictures from uh, the Lego figures, and you need to spend some time to uh, label uh, all the pictures. So actually, you manually said that this is a Lego figure. This is another Lego figure. This is another Lego figure. The best is if you have uh, approximately 200, 300 uh, pictures, and then you already get a reasonable model. But of course, if you have much more, like thousands of pictures, then you can have much more result as well. So this is always a, a, a training activity. The good news here is that uh, uh, as we use the Microsoft ecosystem, everything is broke together. So I didn't have to write any Python code or uh, uh, PyTorch, uh, Sky, uh, or anything. But I just, with next, next, finish with clicks on the portal, I could do uh, the data upload, the data labeling, the training itself. So uh, this was the first time I, as I started to learn about the AI models and how to deal with AI models. Honestly, I had no clue how to start with, and it was a big help that uh, uh, I just started at a very high level. With next, next finish, I had a model, I run it, and uh, I started to experiment it. That uh, uh, how does it look like? And of course, then later I went into deeper and deeper. But it was a, a great starting point to start somewhere and uh, uh, figuring out how to work it. Okay, as. Our server is already ARC enabled, then we can download the model directly to the server. So if we have a trained model, we send it to the uh, server and it will create a REST endpoint. So via REST call, we can uh, uh, use this model. So we need one more script which reads the pictures from the disk, the already saved pictures, send it to the model via REST API, a REST call. It will get back the coordinates, where are the uh, Mm, minifigures are found and then it will draw a boundary box that here is the minifigure and saves the result picture. So we have the original picture and the uh, mm, picture with the uh, boundary boxes. Then we also need a web server which will uh, expose it and this is what you can see on the right side uh, monitor which exposes the original picture and the uh, process picture as well. So it's also running on the same cluster. So this is the setup and it was pretty easy to uh, train a model and then deploy it uh, to uh, the cluster as well. Back to your question, what about uh, the Raspberry? Actually, uh, the uh, resource requirements are pretty low for these resources and uh, uh, even the notebook has uh, 12 gigabyte of memory and 4 CPU cores, so not a heavy ga uh, gamer game. Uh, gamer uh, machine, but uh, uh, it's more than enough to uh, deploy uh, the ARC components. One of the most heaviest one is the uh, database uh, controller. So deploying databases uh, to uh, the notebook, it requires uh, 8 gigabytes of memory alone. And even uh, I can squeeze it into the 12 gigabyte by tweaking the uh, deployment files. So uh, I had to uh, play with it, but if you have a 16 gigabyte of uh, machine, then it will uh, fit nicely. Back to the ARM. Uh, I also have uh, a ROC uh, 5B SBC. This is uh, uh, two or three times more powerful than a Raspberry Pi 5. So it, is, uh, it has a very powerful uh, CPU and it also has an AI accelerator inside the uh, unit. And this is the second one that you can see uh, next to the notebook. So it is also connected uh, to the Azure uh, ecosystem. And uh, uh, actually, this is the one which is running the ML model. Currently, Azure doesn't support ARM, but in the last month, I uh, uh, successfully could uh, uh, port the uh, extension modules, the plugin modules to ARM as well. So now uh, the, ARM, the little ARM boards are also ARC capable as well. Currently it is running as a, uh, on a CPU, but I already have uh, a proof of concept which is working with the AI accelerator as well. <coughs> and just a comparison on the NVIDIA uh, to um, evaluate the picture, it takes approximately 100 milliseconds. On the CPU, on the ARM, it takes uh, 350 milliseconds, so let's say three, four times uh, slower. And with the AI accelerator, it's uh, impaired with the NVIDIA on this notebook. But this is a six-year-old notebook, so just take with a grant of sound that uh, what is the NVIDIA card's capability. 
But I would say that it is pretty nice to comparable uh, with the NVIDIA GPU and comparing the uh, power consumption, which is just coming from uh, overall for 10 watts for the uh, little arm and uh, approximately 50 uh, for the notebook. It's very reasonable, I would say. <coughs> so, the takeaway. Uh, there are a lot of components what we can integrate together. The most important thing is just to think out of the box. So if you have a challenge, then try to figure out something uh, which makes it uh, much more fun. If you would like to start uh, learning a new thing, just take your own uh, use case and uh, start to think uh, uh, inventing something new. And uh, most of the things are also documented on my blog as well, so you can reach it here. And uh, if you wish, I am very happy to show you all the demo uh, for you after the break or in the break. So take your pizza, take your beer, come here and let's talk about the little geek stuffs. Thank you very much.